maybe they did have pyramids. They did. They, were. they did have pyramids. I don't go around claiming people have pyramids <laughs> if they did. <laughs> Things to do with my I think as you were in the realms of the surreal, yeah. we will allow you to have again the benefit of the doubt and continue with the Aztecs with uh, 32 seconds starting now. <laughs> 32 seconds to talk about the Aztecs is not as bad as it seems because now it's probably about 24. <laughs> At... so it's probably about 27. <laughs> Well, what's your challenge? Deviation from time as we know it, yeah. which... <laughs> uh, actually, that's incorrect, because he, his timing was correct. So I think you're going to continue on the Aztecs, Paul. Yeah, great. And 26 seconds are starting now. One of the finest experts on Aztec history lives just over the road from me at the University College of London. His name is a magnificent name. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was trying to avoid Professor. Right, Sue. Um, I think we know what the challenge was. Yes. Yes. So yes. at last you've got in on the subject, Sue. 16 seconds. The Aztecs are starting now. The Aztecs love burritos, mariachi bands and human sacrifices. And we're doing rather nicely, thank you very much, until around the 1520s when I think the Spanish turned up. A conquistador gave them a blanket, <laughs> which... Uh, Marcus Challenge. I think it's conquistador. It not, is conquistador. Not conquistador. <laughs> I'm just a bit common. No, no. <laughs> I think that's deviation from the correct <laughs> word or pronunciation. Conquistador. Conquistador. Oh, when you pronounce it like that. Marcus, benefit of the doubt, oh, you thank have the you. subject because it's, that is the correct pronunciation. The Aztecs with you, five seconds starting now. As tech speak takes over, I find it increasingly difficult to understand what young people are saying. Marcus Brigstock was then speaking as the whistle went and gained that extra point. He's just ahead of Paul Merton and he's just ahead of Sue Perkins, who's just ahead of Sheila Hancock in that order. And Marcus Brigstock, we're back with you to begin. And the subject now is winter sports. From Aztecs to winter sports, what a range we cover in this show. 60 seconds starting now. I love winter sports. For those of you not familiar, it mainly involves paying a phenomenal amount of money to be carried in a lift to the top of a mountain and then prevent yourself from dying on the way down. <laughs> this is not easy to achieve, particularly because you have to attach levers to your feet, which is something the human body can barely withstand. However, However, I can promise you that hurtling down the side of a hill with snow spraying in your face, feeling like you're conquering nature is entirely a mistake because you're almost certainly going to hit a tree or a rock as Sonny Bono did and so many before him. But I find that being in that wonderful big blue sky with the cold wind rushing towards me and the feeling that I'm somehow dynamic and not a man crashing towards 40 fills me with joy and with a sense of power that I know I don't truly possess and yet somehow with my feet strapped down like that I... Uh... Well, that was truly magnificent. You were I'm really... done, thank you. Right. <laughs> You were really reliving what you loved so much. Marcus, you not only kept going until the whistle went and you gained the next point for doing so, you get a bonus point for not being interrupted. Good Lord. Uh, <laughs> yes. You've got the points this time, and there you are, out in the lead, way ahead of the others. And Sheila Hancock, we'd like you to begin the next round. The subject, ooh, interesting, how to cope with a ball. 60 seconds are starting now. I'm not really equipped to answer this question, but I will, Paul, because I always get trapped in parties by the most boring people on earth. They tell me their life histories, and I'm much too kind to say, please go away, you're boring me to death. I read an obituary last uh, week... Marcus Challenge. Yes, a uh, repetition of boring. Um, the word on the card is bore. Yeah. So, Mark, has another point. Gosh, you are on song tonight, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> 44 seconds available. 
How to cope with a bore, starting now. I find the best way to cope with a bore is to buzz in and just stop them from speaking. <laughs> However, I think that under the circumstances, making that... Uh, Sue Challenge. Deviation from the respect owed to Sheila Hancock. <laughs> I was just about to go on and say that that does not apply to the most recent buzz I just did. <laughs> So, I don't people, think he's your champion now. Uh, <laughs> it's gone to my head, folks. I'm sorry. I couldn't help myself. I don't think you should have ever started on that line, actually. I agree. Yes. And the audience he's agree that right. I should take the subject away from you. Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. No, they've turned. And give the benefit of the doubt to Sheila Hancock. I didn't buzz. I know you didn't, I but didn't. you're going to get it because of what he said about you. Oh. Um, <laughs> how to cope with a bore, Sheila. And there are 34 seconds starting now. This lady went to a very boring do, and she was... Uh, Paul Challenge. Repetition of boring. Oh, God! (laughs) You used the word last time you were speaking on somebody. Yes. Paul, we're with you now on how to cope with a bore, and 31 seconds available starting now. Grab hold of their tusks and flip them quickly over your head. (laughs) will have no idea in which direction it's meant to be going. They can be quite vicious. Their habitat is the forests and woodlands of Kent and Sussex. And if you find yourself in those particular low cows and in you... It... <laughs> <laughs> I went into an Aztec saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> the old Aztec saying, when you see a boar, we go away oil. <laughs> Sue, you um, challenged. Hesitation. Yeah. Yes, you did. Right. Sue, 14 seconds. How to cope with a bore, starting now. I know how to cope with a bore because I am one at parties. I'm the person that comes up and endlessly discusses the weather or what to do about the current political situation. You won't be able to get away from me because I talk so quickly, I very rarely pause for breath. <laughs> so, Sue Perkins again speaking as the whistle when gained that extra point. And uh, she's now in second place, along by Paul Merton, <laughs> behind Marcus Brigstock. Paul, we'd like you to begin the next round. The subject is my garden shed. I don't know whether you have one. No, but I you, don't you talk on the subject of my garden shed, starting now. My garden shed is a magnificent structure. I <laughs> built it last Christmas as I was looking to plant the chrysanthemums down by the lower paddock. And you know, there's an old country saying that says... People on the radio who can't do the accent shouldn't bother. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. Was it not Marie Antoinette who said one Christmas, Oh, those spuds that I planted last August. Will they never come up? What shall I give my guests? And the king said to her, You are an historical anachronism that's been fitted into a story for no purpose. <laughs> Sheila, you're challenged. This is not about garden sheds, <laughs> is it? It's gone way off the subject. Well, I hadn't thought about it. I've been enjoying it so much. <laughs> well, Marie Antoinette was growing her stuff around yeah. the back of the garden shed. Well, you he yeah. got away from my garden shed, mm. and, uh, and, and that is true. Well, he wasn't even talking about sheds. <laughs> I know, but so you've got the correct It's a nice challenge. gaff, though, you've got. You've got a paddock and everything. Yeah, yeah, lovely. lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Ten doors. <laughs> <laughs> Sheila, correct yes. challenge. A point oh. and 25 seconds. My garden shed starting now. My garden shed is used for little seedlings and growing things that I'm going to replant in the garden. I have pots and I have cheers. And um, Paul Challenge. I haven't got a garden shed. Yeah. <laughs> Repetition of have. I have, yeah. I have, yes. Paul, you've got the subject back. You've got 14 seconds. My garden shed starting now. I do have a garden shed, and like most garden sheds, it is made of wood. Good, solid pine. As I look at it, I can't help but feel that British craftsmanship is absolutely British. Uh, it's a challenge. <laughs> it's like stumbling, British yeah, craftsmanship. Definitely. It's like hesitative stumble. Yeah, he got the word out. Yeah, he got the word out. No, he didn't. He stumbled. <laughs> You yes. haven't even got a garden shed. I don't know what your button. <laughs> At least I've got a shed. You haven't. I have. Have you? Yeah. Oh. I saved up for it. <laughs> and I'll have a garden one day to go with it. Just you see. <laughs> Just you see. <laughs> Paul, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. Oh, yeah? Right. Three seconds. Tell us more about my garden shed starting now. The interior is beautiful, full of screws. Marcus, you've challenged. More deviation. He said it's a simple wooden structure made of pine. I mean, how beautiful could it be? Oh, <laughs> full of screws, washers, very neat. It all looks lovely. 
Yeah, lovely. I've got it's not beautiful, though, is it, Paul? hanging up just there. It What's beautiful. that? It's something used in metalwork. <laughs> it, you look it up, it's not swearing. In metalwork, it's called a bastard file. What is it? I mean, it's if a you... file that's a bastard. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, Marcus, if, if you have a garden shed and you love it, yeah. then things inside it do have a beauty to it for you. You're saying I mean, the shed is in the eye of the beholder? Yes. <laughs> so, benefit of the doubt, Paul. Oh, gosh, you've only got half a second. Oh. Right. My garden shed, Paul, starting now. Tune it! So Paul Merton was then speaking as the whistle went, gained that extra point, and I've just been told we are moving in to the final round. <laughs> and, uh, right, I'll give you the situation as we do. Sheila Hancock, who did so well last time these four were together, is trailing a little in fourth place, but she's not very far behind Sue Perkins, uh, who did so well last time these four were together, and uh, she's in second place. But in the lead, jointly, are Marcus Brigstock and Paul Merton. And Sue, it's your turn to begin. We'd like you to take the subject and begin on anything and everything. Quite bizarre. <laughs> 60 seconds, starting now. Bats always fly left out of a cave. It's impossible to cry in space. In World War I, the Germans banned the term Gesundheit for sneezers. Pope John Paul was given an honorary membership of the incredible baseball team, the Harlem <laughs> Globetrotters. <laughs> Scuba divers can never fart at a depth below 33 metres. <laughs> Paul, do tell me you're going to contest that last remark. Well, are you? I was going to say it's fun trying, but um, <laughs> I, anything and everything. Of course, you can't deviate at all from that, can you? Because it's everything and everything, so there can't Listen, be any deviation. Well, uh, yeah, no, the... I, I felt there was a bit of a deviation. There was a lot of anything, but I didn't feel we'd arrived at everything. I was getting well, to. <laughs> well, I was building towards everything. You have the benefit of the doubt, mm. Sue. Mm. Because I think you were keeping going on that subject without deviation, and there are 32 seconds available starting now. Nothing, no word in the English language can rhyme with month. Oranges taste unpleasant to members of the Perkins family, to whom they are allergic. My gra... Uh, Paul, Sheila Jones. Okay. Did you say nothing can rhyme with month? M month. 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 Wow. Um... <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, uh, yeah. in fairness, uh, it's not strictly true that month. nothing can rhyme with month. My brother has a lisp and doesn't like the people he works with. <laughs> Welcome to BBC Radio 4. Nicholas, yeah. Nicholas, whatever you do, don't explain it. <laughs> <laughs> I think there is a word that rhymes with month. What is it? I don't know. <laughs> so, you have the benefit of the doubt. You have the subject of anything and everything, and 21 seconds starting now. Some gerbils are born pregnant. Fact, mine wasn't, although I did once have a hamster that had elephantitis of the testicles, and we used to use him as a parlour game. We would place him on the mat and watch him drag his enormous space hopper like appendages around. <laughs> it was like an air sat circus that took place every day in our household, and how we laughed at the wee fella attempting to. <laughs> Anything and everything. Yeah, well, that's right. Anything and everything. Yeah, yes. very it, was, it was very devious, but it was anything and everything. But, Sue, you kept going to the whistle when gained that extra point for doing so. You have moved forward. So the lovely Sheila Hancock was in fourth place. But, uh, <laughs> but she trailed Sue Perkins, but Marcus Brigstock and Paul Merton were equal in first place. So another round of applause for our winners. It only remains for me to say thank you to these four fine, intrepid players of the game. Paul Merton, Sheena Hancock, Sue Perkins and Marcus Brigstock. I thank Sarah Sharp, who's helped me with the score. She's blown that whistle most delicately after the 60 seconds elapsed. We thank Tolusha Gelangny, who is our producer. We're indebted to Ian Messiter, who created this amazing game. And we're grateful to this lovely audience here in the Radio Theatre, who've cheered us on our way magnificently from the audience.